Has a patient ever asked you how long their filling should last? Have you ever wondered how long a filling should last or how long a restoration should last? You know, how long should a composite last? How long should amalgam last? You know, these are all very common questions, questions that patients have, sometimes questions that dentists have, right? And in all truthfulness, any amount of time a restoration would last is probably going to be an estimate or an average amount of time at best. So it's hard to say how long a restoration would last because like many things in dentistry, the outcome is oftentimes just multifactorial, right? There's multiple factors, multiple influencing factors that influence that outcome of how long that restoration is going to last. And you know, some of the things that come to mind when we're talking about longevity of a restoration, you know, you could say, was well, the restoration amalgam? Is it a composite? How large is the restoration? Where's the restoration located? Like which tooth in the arch is it located on? What's the quality of the remaining tooth structure? You know, what structures of the tooth are actually involved? Like, meaning, does the restoration extend down on the root surface? or is it mostly contained in dentin or enamel? So those are some of the questions that come to mind when we're talking about longevity. You know, other questions like, you know, what's the uh, patient's occlusion like? Is the tooth endodontically treated or is it vital? What were the conditions in the mouth during placement? Are there any special considerations that we need to take in consideration that could have compromised the placement of that restoration? You know, how did the dentist place the restoration? What were the steps involved in that placement? And could have any of those steps actually compromise the outcome? Um, how is the patient's oral hygiene, right? That's a big one. Uh, does the patient actually have bruxism? Or do they clench or grind their teeth? You know, all these things. I mean, there's just so many influencing factors that really kind of weigh in on how long that restoration is going to last. So if you look at a review of the literature, you know, there's a lot of studies where researchers compare the longevity of amalgam to composite. And you know, that's kind of a really big topic. It's a popular topic, especially in the United States, because unlike in European countries, you know, we still use amalgam. So when it comes to placing a direct restoration, you have a choice between amalgam and composite in most most situations and you know we try to leave it up to the patient we obviously have things we favor some dentists are trained in dental school now actually to only place composites some dentists have never placed amalgam and you know obviously your training is going to kind of factor in there but hopefully if you're a dentist who places amalgam and composite you can explain to the patient the pros and the cons and when you would choose one over the other and what situations those would be advantageous. You know, and many patients now actually prefer the aesthetics of composite and more and more patients actually want composites to be placed even in the posterior than we've ever seen before in the past. So when you look at these longevity studies, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that a lot of these studies that compare amalgam and composite they discuss things like the annual uh, failure rate of the composite or the amalgam. They'll talk about survival rates. So those are pretty common terms that gets thrown around in these articles. And you know, posterior composite 
studies, um, you know, for the most part, if you're talking about annual failure rates, they're usually below 5%. But a lot of these studies, if you're talking about survival rates, there's just a wide variety of percentages that you'll see in some of these studies. And it's also dependent on how many years that they actually look at these restorations in the study itself. So some studies actually fail to take in consideration some of those very same influencing factors we mentioned earlier. And you know, a prime example would be a study that doesn't take in consideration like the size of the restoration or the teeth in which the restoration is actually placed. You know, those two things are very important uh, pieces of information if you're going to look at a longevity study. So what I'm getting at is some of these studies really don't give you all the information that you need to really make a fair assessment of how long a restoration should last on average. So a study this month in the Journal of Dentistry, they actually looked at longevity of two surface and larger restorations, um, specifically amalgam restorations and composite restorations, and they looked at the survival of these restorations over 13 years. Now the biggest takeaway from this article for me was that amalgam and composite have very similar longevity on average. So a few other interesting things about this study or results of this study actually highlight how longevity itself is multifactorial in nature. And what I mean by that is a couple of the results in the study were actually uh, when they looked at uh, restorations, they saw that they lasted longer in premolars than in molars, which kind of makes sense, right? Because molars obviously take more force because they're in the back of the mouth, so they're closer to that fulcrum. And they also found that um, smaller restorations, like two surface restorations, that they lasted longer than three surface restorations. So when it comes to choosing amalgam or composite, in many situations, I mean, theoretically, you can use either material. But in my opinion, I think it's, it's not can you use the material. It's should you use them, right? Should you use amalgam or composite in those specific situations? You know, is there a situation where amalgam makes more sense than composite and vice versa? So, you know, this is where you need to really kind of understand each material itself. You need to understand the strengths and the weaknesses of amalgam and composite. So that allows you to kind of better choose one material over the other, depending on the specific situation you're dealing with. So let's review some of the considerations for amalgam and composite. All right, so amalgam has a very high compressive strength. Now high compressive strengths can be advantageous, especially when a restoration is present in the molar region. And you know, that's due to the, again, the high amount of force that's generated during function. Now, high amounts of force does not necessarily mean you could not place a composite. Composite's still an option. But, you know, I would just expect that if the majority of the tooth is a composite restoration, that if it's located, speci you know, specifically in some of these bigger teeth, like the molars in the back of the mouth, if you have this huge composite back there, you know, it's probably going to take more of a beating over time. It's going to experience more wear and tear compared to the amalgam. Amalgam is actually less susceptible to moisture compared to composite. And so in, in knowing that, that can actually be a wise choice if you're going to be fighting certain conditions in the mouth where perhaps you have a lot of saliva or a lot of bleeding from that surrounding gingival tissue. Now, personally, I always prefer to have my patients have a cleaning or their SRP completed prior to restorative treatment, but sometimes that doesn't always work out as planned. And if you have a patient that has gingiva that bleeds very easily and you're going to be placing a class two or a class three composite restoration, you know, it's very difficult to place those composite restorations without potential contamination from the bleeding. So composite restorations can be very, very conservative with caries only removal. And really when we're talking about adhesive dentistry in general, it doesn't require you to create undercuts or mechanical retention within the tooth. Unlike 
amalgam, which, you know, primarily, that's the only way it's held in the tooth, right? Mechanical retention, you need adequate thickness of amalgam, and you need those undercuts for that amalgam to stay in place. You know, amalgam preparation should be at least 1.5 millimeters, and those walls should be convergent for retention of that amalgam. And depending on the size of the area to be treated, I would consider composite over amalgam if the goal is conservation of tooth structure. You know, I always favor composite if I know that uh, an amalgam preparation would actually require more removal of good tooth structure. So for the best success of composite, you really need to have good isolation and you need to have enamel. The best bond that you're going to get with composite is going to be to enamel. Dentin is always the most unpredictable bond that we, we actually bond to, right? Dentin is full of moisture compared to enamel. It's very unpredictable. So if I have an enamel margin circumferentially around my preparation, I have more confidence that that composite's gonna last longer. The bond to enamel is so strong, when you etch that enamel with phosphoric acid, you know, that bond is so good that it actually helps prevent microleakage and recurrent caries around those margins. So in what situations do we really not have a lot of enamel at the margin? So think about like class two situations where the preparation margin is deep interproximally, perhaps it's on the root surface, mostly in cementum or dentin only. Um, you can also see this very same issue with cervical lesions that's near the gingival margin. You know, some of those also dip down on the root surface so you don't have enamel at that most apical border of your preparation. And, you know, if you don't have enamel at the margin, that's going to be the area that's always going to be the point of weakness for that restoration. It's going to be the area that's most likely going to show signs of failure down the road, right? You know, in those situations, really amalgam kind of has an advantage over composite because composite relies heavily on that enamel margin bond for that long-term success. So if you don't have it, amalgam kind of has the upper hand in those set, uh, situations, especially so because amalgam actually self-seals over time. So can you place composite if you don't have an enamel margin and you're bonding mostly to dentin? Absolutely. So there is a catch-22 there, though. So the general recommendation is, is that we actually do what's called a sandwich technique. And in those situations where you're going to bond to an area where you don't have enamel, you would actually choose to place either a glass ionomer or resin modified glass ionomer first on that area where the enamel is not present. So if we're talking about a class two preparation, you'd actually place it at the, the base of that box where you don't have that enamel margin. And then on top of that, you're actually layering a composite layer on top of that glass ionomer, on top of that resin modified glass ionomer. And so the, the whole idea of doing that sandwich technique is now you have the chemical bond properties and the fluoride release properties of that glass ionomer. And that kind of helps increase the longevity because now you got that chemical bond where before you were relying on the dentin bonding agent of the composite and the fluoride's helping to strengthen those areas, that's gonna be the point of weakness. So having that fluoride release at that margin is very beneficial. And when you layer the composite over top of that, now you have the strength of the composite and you have the aesthetics of the composite. So basically you're getting the best of both of those products, the best of both worlds. So in summary, you know, the more we look at the literature, it seems that the evidence actually suggests that you know, the longevity of amalgam and composite is very, very similar. Now I'm going to argue that for the best possible results of either material, you really need to understand that material. You need to understand its indications for use, and you need to understand the best practices to actually use that material. As a provider, you're basically responsible for completing the manufacturing process of all those dent dental materials that you use on a regular basis. And for the best possible results, 
we really need to fully understand how to best use our materials. No material is ever going to be the best choice 100% of the time. Last, despite the fact that a lot of the literature suggests that amalgam and composite have very similar longevity, I know many dentists who disagree with that suggestion. So what are your thoughts? I'd like to see you place your comments down below.